For many years, Berlin has been an anomaly within the European game. Despite the fact that Germany are Europe's most successful national team, and the Bundesliga, one of the world's finest football leagues, the country's capital city, has had an unusual relationship with the world's most popular sport. Just take a look around the rest of the continent. In England, three teams from the capital, Arsenal, Chelsea and Tottenham, have won over 100 trophies between them and routinely fight out for the European spots in the Premier League. Spain's capital city of Madrid is home to the most successful team in the history of European competition and two of the three most successful teams in the history of La Liga. Over in Italy, the most successful teams do not hail from the capital city of Rome, but Lazio and Roma remain domestic powerhouses and have won over 30 titles between them. Even in France, where Parisians have for many decades looked on with envy at cities like Marseille and Saint-Étienne, PSG are now the dominant force in the division, and they will soon become France's most successful football club. And then we have Berlin. A city of punks, politicians, and a myriad of juxtapositions. Berlin is, in many respects, a capital of contradictions, as well as being the capital of Germany. And it was perhaps Europe's most significant city for so many reasons during the 20th century. There is a common misconception that Berliners don't have the same passion for football as their Bavarian, Dortmund-dwelling, or Frankfurt-based friends, but that couldn't be further from the truth. Excluding achievements in the GDR era of East German football, Hertha BSC are Berlin's most successful club, with four trophies to their name. That record includes two DFL Liga Pokals, which was the German League Cup, but no longer exists now, and two German championships in the pre-Bundesliga era. No team from Berlin has ever won the Bundesliga, or reached the final of a European competition. But it's not a lack of passion that has prevented Berlin's teams from winning trophies, but a lack of money and a lack of hegemony. Berlin has 14 football teams within the German Football League pyramid, each with their own identities, quirks and rivalries. Berlin's football scene is not too dissimilar to the scene of the Judean People's Front versus the People's Front of Judea in Monty Python's Life of Brian. Whilst there are genuine ideological differences between a large chunk of some sets of supporters, if you get lost down the rabbit hole of Berlin rivalries, eventually you'll find a set of clubs whose animosity between one another seems to stem from a debate about which team hated the Stasi the most. Poor but sexy has long been Berlin's most famous tagline, and for Berlin's football clubs, at least, with the possible exception of Hertha, success has always been an afterthought among supporters. Hertha have spent most of the last 20 years in the Bundesliga, and following a bit of yo-yoing at the start of the 2010s, they began to establish themselves in German football's top flight. But in 2019, Union Berlin won promotion from the second Bundesliga, in scenes you most likely saw shared on social media, reaching the Bundesliga for the first time in their history. And already, you could say, this East German club, forged out of iron and famous for its misfits, is making more of a wave in the Bundesliga than her to have in the last 10 years at least. So settle down, strap in, and get ready as we go on a journey exploring the extraordinary rise of FC Union Berlin. Union can trace their roots back to the start of the 20th century, back when they were nicknamed Schlosser Jungs, meaning metal worker boys, due to the resemblance of the club's kits to the uniforms worn by the community's local factory workers. Union became very popular among the local working class communities contrasted with some of the city's more established clubs. The interwar period was a particularly successful one for Union, as they won a couple of regional Brandenburg championships and even reached the national finals in 1923, where they lost 3-0 to Hamburg at the Deutsche Stadion, which had been built to host the 1916 Olympics, but was later demolished and replaced by the existing Olympia Stadion, which is the ground that Hertha Berlin call home today. Union had more limited success following the rise of the Third Reich and the creation of the Gauliga system, which saw them placed in the Gauliga Berlin Brandenburg top flight. All sports organisations were dissolved by the Allies after the Nazis lost the war, and Union were reformed under a different name in 1945. They regained their original name in 1947, but as Cold War tensions rose between the Soviet-controlled East Berlin and the Western Allied West, Union effectively split into two teams, with a number of their players and coaches fleeing to the West to form SC Union 06 Berlin. Clearly, the infamous brain drain also saw a drain of the GDR's most talented footballers. SC Union Berlin remain as one of Berlin's active football clubs now, although they are real minnows these days, competing in Germany's all-amateur 8th tier. The original Union, from East Berlin, were not just split up, but eventually dissolved, and the current form of Union Berlin were only founded in 1966, rather than in 1906. 
This new iteration of Union had been active within East German football since 1950, but it was only in 1966 that they took on the old name of Union Berlin. Union enjoyed very little success during the GDR era of East German football, an FDGB Pokal title, the East German equivalent of the DFB Pokal, all that they had to shout about. However, while success was limited, support was not. During this period, Union became an unofficial voice of opposition to the brutal East German regime. The GDR was not a safe place for dissident voices, with informants on every corner, and authorities who were renowned for their violence. Football stadiums became a comparatively safe place for punks, rebels, and opponents of the East German regime to meet and talk in relative confidence. A number of East German clubs developed cult-like followings with fans of all political persuasions. Many teams became synonymous with far-right, skinhead, and even neo-Nazi movements, but most of this was just youthful posturing in an attempt to prove who hated the Stasi the most. Few teams were better associated with opposition to the East German regime than Union, but despite their opposition, Union seemingly never attracted the far-right fringes that became associated with a number of East Germany's other clubs. Union could be defined as being anti-authoritarian above all else, which led to a bitter rivalry between themselves and neighbours Dynamo Berlin. Often viewed as being the club of the Stasi, it wasn't the case that all Dynamo fans were slavishly loyal to the GDR's regime, but Dynamo were the favoured club of Eric Mielke, who served as the head of the Stasi from 1957 right up until the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. Mielke also served as Dynamo's president for an extended period of time. A number of East Germany's best players subsequently signed for Dynamo, many said to have been forcibly instructed to do so, and the club unsurprisingly became the dominant force within the East German game. Whilst rivals Union never won a DDR Oberliga title, Dynamo were the division's most successful club, winning 10 consecutive league titles between 1979 and 1988. Once the Berlin Wall fell, Dynamo's players used their newfound freedom to join West German clubs, and Dynamo's dominance came to an end. They now compete in Germany's fourth tier and haven't climbed above the third level ever since reunification. Union, meanwhile, enjoyed very mixed fortunes once Germany was unified. Results were often good, but the club lacked stability and seemed to lurch from one financial crisis to the next. At every turn, supporters found a way to keep the club alive. In both 1993 and 1994, Union won promotion to the second Bundesliga, but a lack of funds meant they were prevented from climbing up to Germany's second division. It took until 2001 for the club to finally win promotion to the second Bundesliga and successfully acquire a license to compete in the second tier, during what was a historic season for the club for more reasons than one. In addition to winning the Regionalliga Nord title and securing promotion, the club fought their way to their first DFB Pokal final where they were beaten 2-0 by Schalke. The accomplishment made Union the joint lowest ranked team to have ever reached the DFB Pokal final, and even a spot as runners-up earned them qualification for the following season's Europa League, despite being a second Bundesliga club. Union put in a strong showing during their first season in the second tier, but it would prove to be short-lived. In 2004, Union were relegated, and the club once again found itself mired in financial difficulties. Supporters began a campaign named Bleed for Union, in which they donated blood to local hospitals around Berlin and donated the money they received for their blood to the club. Union's stadium has been their home, and the home of their predecessors, since it opened in 1920. Unfortunately, by 2008, with the last major work on the stadium having been completed in the 1950s, the stadium was in dire need of some renovation and modernisation. But Union simply didn't have the necessary funds to carry out the required work. Yet again, Union's fans stepped up to the plate, doing all of the manual labour themselves, free of charge. All told, an estimated 140,000 hours of volunteer work went into the renovation process, equivalent to roughly a month of full-time work for 1,000 people, all for a club in the third tier of the German game. All fans feel as though they have put blood, sweat and tears into their clubs, but Union fans take that metaphor more literally than most. Following their fans' extraordinary efforts, the Union players rewarded them with promotion. The club returned to the second Bundesliga during their first season in their newly renovated ground, before inching up the table season after season for the next decade, barring a slight hiccup in 2017-18. That disappointing 2017-18 season convinced the club that action needed to be taken. A new manager, Urs Fischer, was appointed. The one-time Swiss international centre-back had only previously managed in Switzerland, but had been out of work for the last 12 months. 
Nonetheless, in his last job, he had won two Swiss Super League titles with Basel, and the club hasn't won a single league title since. Fischer made some pretty significant changes at Union. Fan favourite Steven Skripski was allowed to depart for Schalke, replaced at centre forward by towering Swedish international Sebastian Andersson. Meanwhile, a new goalkeeper also arrived. Union made a really impressive start to the campaign, and after a valiant display in the DFB Pokal, almost brought an unlikely win against Borussia Dortmund, the team seemed to grow in confidence. It took until two days before Christmas in the 18th league game of the season for Union to lose their first league game. Fischer's side had become draw specialists, but they were picking up points on a routine basis and winning enough games to put them in contention for promotion. No team was running away with it in the second Bundesliga that season, as even the giants of Hamburg and Cologne kept on dropping points. By March, Union looked as well-placed as anyone to secure their first promotion to the Bundesliga, but then came a dreadful run of form. The team went five games without a win, losing to fellow promotion hopefuls Paderborn and Heidenheim. Despite their poor form, a couple of vital wins against Magdeburg and Hamburg in the 31st and in the penultimate game of the season put promotion back in Union's own hands. To secure a historic promotion to the Bundesliga, all Union had to do was beat VfL Bochum in the final game of the season. Bochum were marooned in mid-table with nothing to play for, but they took their role as party poopers pretty seriously. Bochum raced into a 2 0 lead within the first 50 minutes before goal scorer Sylvia Mbusi was sent off for the hosts around 20 minutes from time. Union launched a creditable comeback with two goals in the space of three minutes as the game drew to a close, but it was too little, too late. SC Paderborn won promotion instead of them. All was not lost. Union had still earned a place in the Bundesliga promotion relegation playoffs, but their opponents would be five time German champion Stuttgart. The second Bundesliga promotion playoffs are notoriously difficult, pitting a second-tier side up against a top-flight team with greater resources and typically a larger and more established squad. Union put up a fantastic fight in front of almost 60,000 fans at the Mercedes-Benz Arena in the first leg as the game finished 2 all ahead of the decisive meeting back in Berlin. That scoreline was particularly handy for Union because in Germany's promotion playoffs, away goals rule in the case of the aggregate scoreline ending in a tally. Union knew that all they had to do was beat Stuttgart or draw the game with fewer than four goals being scored, but that would be easier said than done. Across 90 minutes that felt more like four weeks for Union fans, their backline repeatedly repelled Stuttgart's advances. This is a Stuttgart side, it is worth adding, that contained Turkish, Argentine and German internationals, and even a recent World Cup winner with France in the form of soon-to-be Bayern Munich defender Benjamin Pavard. In the end, Union hung on the referee blowing his final whistle with the scores tied at 0-0, a result which sealed Union's place in the Bundesliga for the first time. The celebrations were wild that night. The club that had almost died so many times were now going to face Bayern Munich and Borussia Dortmund as equals. Within a few weeks' time, concerns surrounding the potential commercialisation of the club in German football's top flight were raised, but for now, Union fans were going to party. And party they did. Union became the first club from the former East Germany to play in the Bundesliga since their rivals Hansa Rostock's most recent top flight relegation more than a decade ago. Ahead of life in the top flight, Fischer brought in some much needed experience. Nevin Subotic and Christian Gentner, who have won four Bundesliga titles between them and have almost 70 years of life experience between them, were brought in to bolster Union's plucky squad. Expectations were low, but excitement was at fever pitch when Union stepped onto the pitch for their first taste of Bundesliga football, but they were soon given a taste of what they were up against. Union were thrashed 4-0 by RB Leipzig, a team almost diametrically opposed to everything Union stood for off the pitch, but a far superior outfit on the pitch that afternoon. They regained some confidence the following weekend with a one all draw away at Augsburg before really announcing themselves with a 3-1 win against German giants Borussia Dortmund. Union had proved that they were a Bundesliga side on merit, and they finished the season in 11th place, fairly well insulated with a 10-point gap between themselves and the relegation playoffs. Over the summer, though, Union didn't rest on their laurels. They were active once again in the transfer market, as Urs Fischer's first signing, Sebastian Anderson, was sold to Cologne for 6.5 million euros in order to fund other transfer business. Nevin Subotic was also shipped off to Turkey to free up extra wages, and a total of 13 players were brought in. The most significant of them was Max Kruser, who arrived free of charge from Fenerbahce, having terminated his own contract with the Istanbul club due to unpaid wages. 
An interesting character who hails from Hamburg, Kruse, is known as a bit of a nomad within the German game, having previously played for Werder Bremen, St. Pauli, Freiburg, Borussia Mönchengladbach, and Wolfsburg, as well as being renowned for his other great love, poker. Kruse is a keen poker player who actually made the 2014 World Series of Poker, where he took home $36,494 in winnings. During his time at Wolfsburg in 2016, Kroza was fined €20,000 by the club after it was discovered that he had lost €60,000 worth of poker winnings in the back seat of a taxi. Finding someone €20,000 after they've just lost €60,000 in the back of a cab really is adding insult to injury, and Kroza didn't last long at Wolfsburg after that. Whilst Kroza's attitude and application may have been called into question in the past, he has always been a talent. The 32-year-old has even won 14 caps for Germany, although he never made the squad for a major tournament. Capable of playing in any advanced role, whether it be out wide, as a number 10, or even as a centre-forward, Kroza has become Union's wildcard this season, and he has been one of the outstanding players in the Bundesliga. Operating as either a second striker or attacking midfielder, Kroza has added a touch of class to an industrious and willing Union side, and he has already made 11 goal contributions in 10 games so far this season. In fact, on a goal or assist per minute basis, only Robert Lewandowski, Thomas Muller and Erling Haaland have been more effective in the final third so far this season. The result is a Union Berlin side which is flying high in 6th place in the Bundesliga table, one point behind Borussia Dortmund with a game in hand. It's a rise which would have seemed unthinkable just a few years ago and downright laughable a decade or so ago when Union fans were selling blood and learning how to mix cement in order to keep the club afloat. Union have only lost two of their first 16 games so far this season and have already tasted victory against Borussia Dortmund and drawn with Bayern Munich, although they could ruin a couple of those stats with a defeat to RB Leipzig on the evening that I am recording this video and they might even have played for a second time against Augsburg before this video comes out. Then again, they might win both and then this video will seem particularly apt. Ultimately, Union's rise is a rare genuine fairy tale story in an increasingly sanitised and commercialised sport that lacks them even in Germany. Few sets of fans deserve success more than the Iron Union faithful, but then again, few view success as being less important in terms of their love of their club and what the team means to them. It seems like a cruel joke that during Union's most successful period, their fans should be starved of attending games by a global pandemic that continues to disrupt everyday lives throughout the world and in Europe more than most. But whatever happens to Union Berlin, whether they win the Bundesliga title this season or end up going down, the Union fans will return in their droves. Their love of their club are moved by success or failure. That is it for today's video, but thank you all as ever for watching. Give us a like if you enjoyed the video, let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications for HITC7. You can also find me on Twitter or Instagram via the username at HITC7s should you wish to do so.